Thank you for having me. Um, so like Smara said, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the work that I did for my dissertation in 2009 and 2010 with my advisors, Bonnie Dore and Philip Resnick. Um, and I think three people have already asked me this, and I've met with three people, like, is ETS doing machine translation? And the answer is no, they're not. And, but there's a bit at the end, which I'll explain why this is important to my work at ETS, too. OK. So Smart told me this was going to be a more general audience than you know the typical MT audience that I'm used to giving a talk to. So I decided, OK, I'm going to decompose this into three parts. And the first part is something that I've been wanting to write for a long time, is to introduce statistical machine translation without showing a lot of equations. Uh, so the amount of math is obviously greater than zero, but hopefully it won't put you to sleep. Uh, so that's first part. And so once you have a sort of a conception of what statistical machine translation is and what it does, then I will talk about something that's generally not talked about when people talk about statistical machine translation outside the MT community or the machine learning community, which is this thing called parameter tuning, which is something that you can't actually do machine translation, statistical machine translation without. And it requires some special kind of data that is hard to get. So my dissertation work, which is third part, is basically to use statistical machine translation itself to manufacture this special kind of data as opposed to relying on finding it in the wild and paying people to do it. So those are the three parts. So um, let's start with the detailed look inside what an SMT, which is the term I'll use for statistical machine translation all the time now. Um, what does it look like? What does this pipeline look like? So I think everybody here should pretty much know they've used Google Translate what um, statistical machine trans or machine translation in general looks like. So you have documents in your source language. Source language here I'm using is Chinese. Uh, I got this from Xinhua. And uh, you to a black box and call the system. And then comes out the um, uh, documents in the target language that you desire, which in this case is English. So uh, one thing that I should mention here is even though I'm showing you here documents, a Chinese document going to a English document, as MT exists, statistical machine translation exists right now, we model translation at the level of sentences. We don't know anything about uh, intra-sentential relations. Right now we're just trying to correct sentence in one language in another language. So essentially these boundaries that are documents are externally imposed. The MT system doesn't know anything about them. Just sentences to the system. So just to sort of get you a sense of uh, uh, where things are. OK, and then um, <laughs> the two things have ideally is the translation should be semantically adequate, which means that all of the meaning that was in the source language utterance or sentence or document should carry over to the target language. So there should be no meaning lost. That's what we want. And the other thing is, whatever is rendered in the target language, whatever meaning is rendered, is fluent in that language. So it shouldn't be word salad. It has a bunch of words that mean the same thing, but they're not in some random order that don't make any sense. So adequacy and fluency are the two dimensions that we are um, aiming for. OK, so sort of a little bit of history. Um, the, f the machine translation task was first conceived by Warren Weaver back in 1949 when he wrote this memo called Translation. Um, and it's actually an interesting read even today if you go and read it and sort of think, think about what he was thinking of as, to, as, as translation is, whether a machine can actually do it. Um, and I was just telling somebody that the history of Machine translation is probably one of the most colorful academic histories of any um, discipline that I've read about. Because it went through sort of lulls and highs. And so, but in the last two decades, uh, such as statistical machine translation and machine translation in general has become one of the most challenging and popular tasks in the NLP community. If you go to any NLP conference, you'll see like six parallel sessions devoted entirely to machine translation um, as opposed to other things about that. But that's how it is. Um, so before, in the late 80s, before the statistical approaches took over, sort of became the dominant um, and state of the art, uh, there were three other approaches um, that used to be popular. So there was a rule-based approach where the goal is to basically write a bunch of rules 
that take um, specific parts of the source language and translate them to speci you know, specific parts of the target language. So you don't do any analysis of what the source language is. You don't do anything. You just write rules. And as you can see, it's a very, it requires a lot of knowledge, requires a lot of effort. So um, not really very ideal uh, for large scale translation. The second thing was uh, interlingual translation. This is actually something my advisor Bonnie worked on when for her dissertation at MIT, uh, where you basically take the source language text and you reduce it to some language independent um, formalism, and then you generate the target language text from that target from that language independent formalism. And as you can imagine, this requires a lot of analysis and has a lot of moving parts that don't always work together very well. Uh, and then people said, oh, what about if we go something in the middle where we do a little bit of analysis and then write some sort of rules to do the, to transfer from that analytic form to the target language analytic form. So it's not going all the way to language independent, it's going a little bit towards it. Um, as you might guess, um, these three approaches no longer exist, except for actually rule-based. Sistran still does rule-based translation, but they don't do specifically only rule-based translation. They combine it with statistical machine translation to do sort of hybrid, a uh, hybrid system. So, which is weird, because if I had to bet money on which of these would survive, I would have said rule-based would definitely not survive. But people have invested a lot of money and effort in developing these rule-based systems, so they don't want to, you know, uh, let them go to waste. So, okay, statistical machine translation. The machine translation is actually very simple. It's driven by methods that were taken from the statistical machine learning community. And what does that mean? It means, um, let me describe that in three steps. So step zero, I call that step zero because it's not actually a step where you have to do anything computational. You just have to go out and find lots and lots and lots of data, as you would expect you know, from a machine learning technique. And this data has to be a special kind of data. It has to be text in the source language, for example, Chinese, and text in the English language, uh, target language, English, at the level of sentences. So somebody should have gone through and said, this sentence translates to this sentence exactly. So you have to find not just document level, because you might have things that are missing in one document and the other. So that's not ideal. Ideally, you want it at the sentence level. And that's why SMT works at the sentence level. So after you have this huge amount of data, um, then what you do is you go to, this, go to step one, which is to apply a learning algorithm to take this parallel corpora, I call them parallel because you know, they're parallel along two linguistic dimensions, and you build this approximate, approximate model of human translation. And I call it approximate because we're, trying to, we're striving for exactly how a human does it. Obviously, uh, it's a machine learning algorithm, so it can't really do it uh, exactly. And then step two is you take this model that you've learned of human translation and you apply it to new data that you haven't seen before and you get out translations. Typical machine learning setup, right? So one caveat there is, as I'll explain, you'll, you'll see, notice that I didn't say unseen source language text. So one of the big things about statistical machine translation is if you're trying to translate words, Chinese words that you've never seen before, it can't do it. It can do, it can translate different of those words that it's seen before, but it can't do, like, if it doesn't know what the Chinese word, and a Chinese word for, I don't know, whatever, internet means in English, can't tell you that. It's essentially memorizing translations from this large amount and just putting it. Okay. So we'll, we'll go through it and then you'll see. Um, and like I said before, uh, everybody's used Google Translate or Bing Translate. So essentially, those are all statistical translation systems. And they're the current state of the art um, and basically dominate most academic research and industrial research programs. OK. So let's go through this. So assuming you have step zero done. You found this parallel corpus, or that, as I call, bitext, where you have sentence-level correspondences between Chinese and English. And generally, you need this to be in the depends on how good do you want the system to be. If you want the system to be really good, you need to have at least millions of words uh, in each language that are in this data. And obviously, that's not always true. You're not going to find millions of words for Inuit or Hungarian or you know, with, paired with English. So all depends on the source language. But for our example, Chinese and other languages like Arabic and 
Urdu and French and Spanish, languages that are spoken around the world a lot, you can find pretty good amounts of data. So you take this data and you pass it to this black box that I'll describe in detail later, is what this black box does is it learns what phrases in the Chinese language, where by phrases I mean sequences of words, translate to what sequences of word in the English language. And then it also outputs likelihoods of those trans you know, translating to each other. Uh, and what you get out is this thing called Chinese to English translation model, which we hope, if you think back to the thing, uh, to the first slide where I said we want semantic adequacy, this is the thing that should account for the semantic adequacy. This is the thing that should say, if I have these, um, this meaning expressed in the Chinese language, this model should then produce all the English phrases that are needed to express in the English language, right? But you, you know, are you going to say, okay, so that's adequacy, what about fluency? So that's the other step, is you take just the English part of the bi-text, the English part of the parallel data, and you give it to this other model, what good English sentence. And for those of you who are in NLP, this is just a simple n-gram language model, where you learn that the probability of uh, man following the is higher than the probability of off following the, for example. So now we have this process that not only models semantic adequacy, it also models target language fluency. OK. So what does this actually look like? So the way that you do this is you take all the Chinese English sentence pairs that you have in your parallel data. And I'm showing this here as a, as a matrix just for the ease of illustration, but you'll see why. So then you use a, this thing called an unsupervised learning algorithm, which basically discovers what words in the English language align to or correspond to what words in the Chinese language. I learn here that um, the, uh, oops, there it is. So that the word fast aligns to this Chinese word and the word population aligns to this uh, Chinese word and so on and so forth. And then you will you know, fill out this matrix which basically says each word on the English side aligns to each word on the, on the Chinese side. So that's, and then what we, we, we call this an alignment matrix because it tells you, you know, the alignments between the English and the Chinese uh, words. Okay, so that's words. But I, remember I said sequences of words. We're translating phrases. So then what you do is you take these words and you sort of try to generalize to the level of boxes on this alignment matrix. So for example, you will say uh, this phrase, fast population, if you draw a box around this, that will align, that corresponds to this Chinese phrase. And you will draw a box around this, you can draw a box around this, and so on and so forth. The only constraint for the box is that any of the words that participate in the box should not be outside that box. So for example, you can't say that I'm gonna call, make this a box, like fast population growth aligns to this two word Chinese phrase because the alignment for growth is outside that box. Does that make sense to everybody? So you, you have to draw this box instead, not this two by three box. So you have to make sure that the alignment points for all the words that participate in that phrasal correspondence are inside the box that you're drawing. So it's a math, you know, easily expressed as a mathematic. I'm just trying to show you, we're trying to generalize from words to phrases. So here's examples of what these phrases look like. So notice that the word by itself can also be a phrase. It's just a one word sequence. So you can have this as a word, which is what this says and what this says. And then you can have, you know, um, effectively contained, so that's this one. That's this box right here. And I'm showing the numbers uh, just to show you the positions of the words that are participating in the box. So at this point, we have a huge list of English phrases that correspond to Chinese phrases, right? We've done that over the entire uh, training data. So we should have millions and millions of these things. What's the next thing? The next thing is we need to get some sense of the goodness of these phrases that you've learned. So what you try to do then is to learn feature functions over these phrases. So what do these feature functions look like? So most of these features are sort of very simple relative frequency features that you can estimate by maximum likelihood. They can use maximum likelihood estimation for. For example, you extracted a bunch of phrases. So if you say, um, how many times did I see the word, the Chinese phrase C1, C2, 
extracted with the English phrase even E2, as opposed to all the other phrases that were extracted with. So you take the frequency of the Chinese phrase C1, C2 over all the English phrases, and then you use that as a denominator and the specific count of the numerator. So it's simple relative frequency that tells you, you know, how frequent things are as opposed to other things. And then the other last two features are, and obviously you can do this in the reverse direction, that's the second feature, because you can do it, you know, from the level of English. Okay, so what about the last two features? The last two features say, looking inside the phrases, how well do the words in the English phrase translate to the words in the Chinese phrase? So that's actually going back, you'll do is you'll go back to the alignments that you discovered, and you will say, how many times did the word the in English translate to the Chinese word, whatever the equivalent is, if there is one, and within, within all phrases. So you will you know, try to get a sense of uh, something inside, goodness inside the phrase too. Okay, so um, now at this point, we have a huge list of phrasal correspondences, and for each of them, we have a list of features that we have computed. How do we combine this all together into something that we can use as a model? So you need a probabilistic model, obviously. So the most common approach is to use a discriminative model, which is uh, basically saying that we want to directly model the, pr the conditional probability of generating uh, the translation E, this thing, this E, for a given source language sentence F. So that's essentially what it's saying. You don't have to pay attention to the math. All you need to know is that all we're doing here is taking each feature function, multiplying it by a weight lambda, and then summing them all together. So just some sort of additive score that describes uh, the combination of all the features, a weighted combination, right? So this model represents the likelihood of generating target language sentence E given source language sentence F. So we have a model, great. How do we apply the model? So I'm going to, I'm going to, this is the part where I have to use a little bit of math, but I think it should be fairly easy math um, for anybody who's taken probability. So let's talk about it from the math sense first. So as I said before, this is the model score, right? This tells you the probability of generating, the likelihood of generating a specific um, target language translation for a specific source language sentence. Now if I take the scores over all possible translations that I can construct using the correspondences that I've learned, right? So I can take all the ways of translating Chinese phrase C1, C2, all the, phrase, all the ways of translating Chinese phrase C3, C4, and all the ways they can be put together. And so I take the model scores of all of those translations, and I, do, I find the one that has the highest score, right? That will give me the best translation sort of an easy way to think about it, right? You do an argmax over all the possible w probabilities, and the thing that has the highest probability will give you the, that will be the best translation. So this is the math part. So let's look about it, you know, from the software perspective, from the pipeline perspective, what does it look like? So focus in the, the middle, the white box first. So it says, you take the translation model, which is essentially the phrasal correspondences and the probabilities that we have learned, and you combine it with that language model that I talked about that tells you about something about fluency, and you put that together into a piece of software called, you know, you can call it whatever, search tool. Um, and then you give it new Chinese sentences, and what it will essentially try to do is construct all possible ways of translating that Chinese sentence, sentence and output the one best translation of that sentence, which is the, which is the translation that has the highest probability according to that model, right? So, Let's talk a bit about this thing that I just described, because I was kind of bullshitting here. First, let's a bit of historical. So if you notice, I called the search tool decoder. And the reason for that is a bit historical, because when Warren Weaver described translation in 1949, he thought of it as cryptography. He thought Russian was basically a code for something that we don't know about. And we're going to treat it as a cryptography problem. We're going to try to break the code, bring it back to English you know, essentially what you would do for any other cryptography problem. So a decoder has sort of stuck around in the minds of, you know, SMT people since then. So this search tool that basically does that same thing, takes a Chinese language sentence and brings it back into English, is called a decoder. So just a bit of perspective. So I talked about, so the way that I described the math formula was, you search over the space of all possible translations that you can construct. Now, as anybody, as anybody who's taken a, theory class, as soon as they hear the word 
space of all possible something, you should immediately think of NP-complete. There's no way you could search over all possible uh, translations of something, because there's multiple, lots of ways to translate something, right? Actually, there was this paper that he did uh, back in the 90s where he showed that brute force decoding, where you're, decoding, you're looking over the space of all possible things, is actually equivalent to the traveling salesman problem. So, which thing comes in. So when you write, when you need to write a decoder that actually, you know, is efficient and doesn't keep searching, you need to do some sort of heuristic search, like beam search or A star or uh, clever search algorithm that you know people have come up with in the last ten years uh, um, to find the uh, to find the best answer or close to the best answer. Okay. Now the other thing that I sort of glossed over here is I told you here's a Chinese sentence. I break it up into phrases. I translate them as English and I have my translation. But languages have very different word orders. So I didn't really talk about, I could translate this English phrase here, but then this should move over here, and this one should move over here, and there should be all sort of reordering operations going on. But I'm not going to talk about that here, but I'm just mentioning it because a decoder has to take that into account. Because when it's trying to construct a space of all possible translations, possible translations include things that reorder phrases, right? So you can't just ignore it. But Again, simplifying assumptions have to be made. Things may not move more than, wor you know, more than distance two, or so on and so forth. However, um, whatever uh, assumptions you make, you have to make it um, uh, to, to make the uh, decoding go faster. OK, so now we have sort of a practical sense of what decoding looks like. Right? Can't search over all possible trans Yes? Chinese and English are both SDL languages. Yes. Uh, would that assumption you just made work if you're doing that in Japanese? The assumption of moving only two, I don't think it will work, no. Yeah. You, you have to make, this is why you have to, when you're trying to write a decoder for, you have to change your assumption based on the source language that you're translating, right? So uh, th that's a good question, exactly. Make the assumption based on the source language. Uh, and you might make sort of a weaker assumption which might accommodate more languages, right? So it depends on the approach that you're taking. OK. so. Um, you have this practical sense of how decoding works. Can search over all possible translations. Have to narrow down. Have to narrow down the beam, uh, the search somewhat. Have to make some simplifying assumptions and so on and so forth. So because of all these assumptions and simplifying heuristics that you're using, you can actually have errors in your decoding process. So there are two kinds of errors that I can think of that are sort of um, uh, popular in the MT community to talk about. There's a model error which says that your model is mathematically inadequate. To describe, to you can translation. the correct translation is not even possible in the space of all possible translations. So that's a model error. You can't really do anything about that. In your entire mathematical model. So you just have to. Sometimes you just have to live with uh, the model error and say, okay, it may not be the ideal correct translation. Maybe a good enough translation might be all we need. And then there's the decoder error, which is actually something that's something you can fix because that's a problem in your software. Is the model can represent the correct answer, but the decoder is not smart enough to put that answer at the top and make that the one best translation. Right? It might be like the tenth best translation, and the first <laughs> translation, the one best that comes out of the decoder, is something that actually has is, is a worse translation. So that's a that's a search error because you couldn't search properly. So that's something that you have to fix or you should fix. And obviously, both of these errors are hard to determine. I mean, how do you tell whether something is there was in the uh, something was in the something was correct in the possible in the space of all possible translations or not? So there's ways to uh, people have sort of come up with ways to do some sort of oracle testing and stuff. I'm not going to go into that, but that's sort of what I wanted to say about decoding. Okay, so I showed you learning a translation model and then doing decoding. Does that mean we're done? MT is over. Not really. Uh, as with most NLP things, you really have to know whether all this hard work you've done is actually giving you anything useful or is it still giving you word salad. So evaluation is something that we haven't talked about yet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about evaluation because that will feed into everything else that I'm talking about. So uh, there's two ways to evaluate your system. You could say, here's the output of my system. You could show it to a bunch of Chinese English bilingual speakers who speak both Chinese and English. And you're going to say, OK, take a look at the source sentence. That I, that I translated, take a look at the translation my system produced, 
and rate the translation on for fluency and adequacy on a five point scale each, for example. So, and then when you get those output back, you're like, great, so now I know my system is very fluent. It's not getting the adequacy, it's very inadequate. So I so must be something wrong with my translation model. Or if it happens the other way around, it has the right words, they're just really all over the place. So that means something's wrong with my language model, my fluency is all screwed up. Unfortunately, when you're trying to build a system, you're like, oh, let, I have this idea for a cool new feature. I'm going to throw it in the system, and then output will come out, and then I have to wait three weeks to find out whether the feature actually did anything. Not really very, pra very practical when you're doing system development or research, and you want fast turnover. So we want something that is still correlated with human judgments. It should be used, but has So that's option two. So what we do for option two is we have data sets out there where we have Chinese sentences and we have human English translations for them already produced. So what we do is we take the Chinese sentence, we produce our translation, and we compare our translation to this human produced reference translation. Let's call it that way. And then we use the metric that tells us how close we are to that human translation. Right? So that's a much faster thing because you you know, you'll just uh, run on that data set and then basically compute this automated thing that will tell you whether or not your feature did anything. So that's, that's what we want. Um, so one of the metric uh, or blue, which actually was what, how people said it for maybe two months after the metric came out and then everybody's like, no, I'll just call it blue. Um, so the math isn't important. It's, 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 it's a little bit complicated, but all you need to know is all it does is it measures how many word sequences in one sentence overlap with how many word sequences in the other. So if you have a human, well actually, I can give you an example. So let's say I have a Chinese sentence and this is the output that my system gives. For that, uh, for that Chinese sentence. And we've asked a human to produce a reference translation for this. So let's see what, over, what, what word sequences are overlapping here. So the word the is overlapping, the three word sequence off corruption has is overlapping, the two word sequence off people is overlapping, and so on and so forth. So Blue takes this into account and says, okay, well you have these four things that overlap. And according to Blue, this is a pretty bad, you know, this is bad. Like it's only four words are overlapping, or four sequences. But if you think about it, the things that are not overlapping are actually paraphrases of each other, right? This is, this, these two sentences are exactly the same. They're telling you exactly the same thing. So blue is actually underperforming here. It's not telling you the right thing. So how do we get around that? So uh, one of the ways to get around that is to ask two more humans, for example, to give you independent translations of the same source sentence. So hopefully, because they're independent, they will use different words. And then you will match, and you tell Blue, no, don't just match against reference number one. You're free to match against reference number two and three as well. So now you can see the thing that wasn't matching before, which was you know broad masses, is now matching because, oops, sorry about that, is now matching because it was present in another reference translation. So this is how Blue works. So this is great. You know, Blue is giving us great things. We have problem solved. Uh, unfortunately, no. So asking three independent humans to give you translations is quite expensive. And mostly what happens is most translation agencies only ask one human to give you, you know, to give you a translation. So that's it. So you'll, have, you'll end up with only one reference translation. So as I showed you, this will lead to unfair Blue scores, right? Because Blue will tell you, this is a pretty bad system translation, when in fact, it's a pretty good system translation. So this is something I want you to keep in mind as we go forward, is that Blue with one reference is bad. Right? So let's continue. So let me sort of give a, you know, we've talked about a whole bunch of things. Let me sort of do a brief recap of the whole thing so everybody's on the same page. So we start with training data, which is by text, parallel data, sentences. We pass that to these two things that discover alignment between words of the two languages, and then extract phrases from those words, and then assign features to those phrases. And so the output of that is this thing called a phrase table, which is basically this database of Chinese to English phrases, along with the features that come out with them. Right? So that's, that's what we call them, phrase tables. The other thing we do is we take the English part of that, uh, and make a language model, right? Like I told you, this is the, the phrase table is the adequacy part, the language model is the fluency part. 
So then we put those, things, those two things inside a decoder, right? That search thing, that, uh, the tool that searches over all possible translations. And we run that on some test set, which is different from the training set, obviously. And it contains both the Chinese text that you want to translate and reference translations for those, for, the, for those Chinese sentences. And then you produce your translations, and you compare your translations to the human reference translations, and you get out a blue score, which is generally between 0 and 1. So if your score, if your output for this is between is close to one, you're like, wow, I'm doing a really great job. My system is doing really well. Obviously, as with most machine learning things, that could be a case that you know it's really easy to translate or whatever. But for the, this is how we measure. So you'll measure for a bunch of test sets and see how you're doing. So that's the overall overarching picture of statistical machine translation. So are we done now? Uh, and that leads me to part two, which says that we aren't. So, so notice that I have conveniently glossed over something in this picture that I showed you before. Um, we had this model formula, right? This discriminative model, this probabilistic model that gives you the likelihood of target language sentence E given source language sentence F. Where are these lambdas coming from? So I totally didn't mention that, right? I completely, so that's, so if these lambdas are what are called parameters or feature weights or whatever. And that's what parameter tuning is, is figuring out what these lambdas are. So as with most machine learning things, when you have to estimate parameters, you have to do it on some data that is not, not your training data, because you're using the training data to figure out the phrasal correspondences and the features and all that. So you don't want it to be influenced by that. And you don't want it to be your test data, obviously, because you know that should be a blind set. So you need some held out data, so that's one thing. Um, and if you rem and the best way to lambdas um, objectively is not to use that model score, not to use the lambdas and maximize that PE given F, but instead to maximize some objective translation quality, right? So we want the quality, not the best model score, because the model score doesn't mean anything. So it should be something objective. And what's the objective? The closest to human objective function we know that's automatic, blue, right? So this is the formula that you have to do. And it looks complicated, but actually, it's fairly easy. Because what it's doing is, so notice that this is just the decoding equation, right? Arg max over all the e's for a particular you know, f. So that's just telling you to find the best translation that you can according to the model. And then you compare, use blue to compare against the reference translation. And then you find the lambdas that have the maximum, that has the maximum blue over all possible uh, sentences, sentence pairs in your held out data. Right? That's all it's saying. And so the, again, that's why you have the argmax, because the lambdas for which this sum is the maximum. So OK, that sounds like an easy thing to do, except you have this argmax inside the blue function, which makes this, you can't, you can't compute the gradient of it. It's discontinuous this function inside, because you have an argmax. So no longer can you do the simple things that you used to do, which is like, oh, I'm just going to compute the gradient, do a gradient ascent, do hill climbing, and I will have my lambdas. Unfortunately, that's not possible here. So we have to do something different. And what is that something different? So, um, so this is where, before you remember before I told you, don't pay attention to the mathematical structure of the model, this equation. But actually, now you should pay attention, because this is what's going to help us out. This is why we chose this model is notice that the denominator is just a constant, right? You're just summing over all the e's. That's just a constant for that, for that particular translation. So, and if you take the log of the numerator, what you end up with is basically a weighted sum of feature values, right? It's just lambda times h over all the possible number of features there are. And then, if you think about it even further, what you could do is, okay, well, what if I hold all the lambdas constant except one? Then what you end up with is this equation, where you have this. And then again, this is a constant, because these are not changing. So th remember the equation of the line from, I don't know, uh, whenever, whenever we learned about that. And so then you can say, oh, what if I only optimize one lambda at a time, as opposed to optimizing all together? Then I could do something like line maximization, which is a well-known way of optimizing a single parameter. So that's es essentially what happened is uh, the guy who's head of uh, Google Translate now, uh, before he was there, came up with this algorithm back in 2003, which is actually very simple if you think about it. 
is all it's doing is it's an iterative algorithm. At every iteration, it assigns random values to lambdas and says, OK, now hold one of them, hold all of them constant except this one, optimize this one. OK, now hold this one constant and all of the other one, and then optimize the second one, and then the third one, and then the fourth one, and then the fifth one. And you do all of them, and then the collection of those optimized values that give you the largest blue increase you know, over the dev set or the tuning set, that's the lambdas you pass on to the next iteration. You start from there in the next iteration, right? And so on and so forth. So there's a couple of uh, things that you need to do is because this function is not convex, there is no one, op there's no global optimum. There's a bunch of local maximum or local uh, optima. So you have to have some sort of random restarts in there to make sure that, oh, you might not, you're not going down the wrong path. So you have to start randomly from some points just to make sure that you're covering all your bases. So essentially, that's all it's doing is starting with a bunch of random values, optimizing them one at a time, and then passing them along in each iteration. And when do you stop? Well, you stop when you're stuck at some optimum. Lambdas aren't changing. And then you're done. That's the best you can do. You presumably do this from multiple different Yeah. Options. There's 20, like I said, there. So you, there's the initial one that you start from, and you use 19 more. And then the initial one becomes the best from the last iteration, and then 19 more. And so at each point, you're exploring in addition to the one you start from, 19 more random points. Exactly. So yes, because obviously if you don't start from additional random points, yeah, you know, you're going to get stuck. Right. So obviously, so you do that. So essentially, think of it in, in a big picture way. All this is doing is we have this big, big huge, multi-dimensional parameter space, right? So let's say we have six features. So you have a six-dimensional space. And all it's, this algorithm is doing is it's starting at this point saying, OK, I'm going to generate the translations that I can here. I'm going to compare the blue for those translations, compute the blue for those translations. And then I'm going to see, oh, this one gave me pretty good blue. OK, I'm going to go in this direction. And then it's going to do the same thing here. So it's sort of intelligently traversing this multi-dimensional parameter space to end up in a point that is likely to give you the best translation quality, according to the dev set. And you hope that it generalizes to your test set. So that's all it's doing. But remember when I, um, so when I told you, so this exploration is only useful when at each point the blue that you're computing is actually giving you an accurate picture of translation quality. And remember when I said before that blue with one reference is bad? So that's essentially what you, mean, what you need is in order to make blue fair at each point, you need to have multiple reference translations. And like I said, you don't have those. You only have one. So if you're, if you're optimizing a dev set that has a single reference translation at each point, you're computing a blue that's deficient in some nature, and you're going to end up in a point that's not actually the thing that's going to give you the best translation quality. So that's the problem. So part three is the solution. Isn't that great how that works out? Um, so this is the, the solution that I and a bunch of other people thought about, which is um, we have one human reference translation. Is it possible for us to automatically manufacture the other reference translations that we need? And if so, is it possible to do so using the bilingual training data that we have? Can we exploit the fact that we have the semantic equivalence between two languages? So and the way that to think about it is, if a Chinese phrase, C, translate into both the English phrase E1 and E2, then shouldn't that mean that all of them have the same meaning and E1 is a paraphrase of E2? Right? That's the logical thing to say uh, if everything is semantically equivalent and C is equivalent with E1 and C is equivalent with E2, then E1 and E2 should be equivalent with each other. So this is a great theory, theoretical um, you know, exercise, but is there any empirical evidence that this works? And empirical evidence was provided by um, my good friend Chris Callison Birch, in, uh, who was now at Hopkins back in 2005, where basically what he did was he took that phrase table. Remember that phrase table I showed you in the pipeline picture, which was basically a database of phrase, Chinese to English phrases and a bunch of features? He said, OK, I'm going to go through, I'm going to find all the English phrases that have the same Chinese phrase, and I'm going to say that those two things are paraphrases of each other. And then, so that's what he did. And this is the th sort of thing he got. So you, in, the, in the phrase table, you have this phrase pair, this Chinese phrase is, uh, corresponds to this English phrase, and it also corresponds to this second English phrase. So he said, OK, these two English, paraf English phrases are paraphrases of each other. And that actually, in these examples, so the first one is not exactly a paraphrase, but 
there's a lot of semantic equivalence there. So what he found was like, which is what I said, so I call these pivoted paraphrases because you're pivoting over the Chinese side, right? You have, think of it like this. You have the English, the Chinese here, here and one English there. And all I do is just this Chinese to make the two. So I call these pivoted paraphrases. And what he found is what you can see here is that most of these paraphrase pairs that you induce are only approximately semantically equivalent. They're not exactly semantically equivalent. So, so I, I looked at this work and I said, well, OK, that's great for phrases. But what we want is that at a level of sentences. We don't care about phrases. So what do we do about sentences? And actually, it's fairly simple. If you think about it, you just carry that anal analogy even further. You say, now that I've pivoted these paraphrases, I treat them as English to English translation rules in an English to English phrase table. right? And since you are still out English as your target language, the English model still works, right? So you can reuse that. And you can take that uh, English to English phrase table that you computed, combine that with this language model, and the same decoder that you had before. You don't have to make any changes to it because you still have to find the best scoring paraphrase, most fluent, most semantically adequate, according to this model. So that doesn't change at all. So that means now we can generate paraphrases for any English sentence that you give me. right? It's basically a translation, but it's a translation from English to English. It's a paraphrase. So, so the, one of the natural questions is, well, you had a bunch of features. What happens to the features? The features are defined from you know, Chinese to English as opposed to English to English. Well, you can actually compute English to English features using the Chinese to English features, for example, like this. So the number of times the phrase E1 was seen, because it was actually seen, right? There's no but the number of times phrase E1 was estimated to be seen with E2 is basically the product of the times uh, E1 was seen with F and E2 was seen with F, right? The same thing. So you just take the, take the uh, use the probability rule to multi multiply that. And that's it. And that's your new feature. So you have now, from a collection of Chinese to English phrases and features, a list of English to English phrases and corresponding features. What that does. So remember, this is the pipeline that I showed before. You have the, the data and then the bunch of word alignments, and then all this. So all we're doing is get rid of that, and that's it. You take the English Chinese to English phrase table, construct the English to English paraphrase table, put that inside the decoder with the language model, and instead of giving it Chinese sentences, give it English sentences. And on the other side, you will get English sentences that have the same thing as the original English sentences, which are paraphrases, right? So that seems like a great idea. So here's some actual examples of how this, how this looks, what this looks like. And I've chosen them in decreasing order of paraphrase quality so you can sort of see that two points here. This seems to work better for shorter sentences, which is true for MT in general. Because as you have longer and longer sentences, there's more and more uncertainty about what makes the translation. And, and the other thing is it, the first one is actually good quality. I mean, that, I would consider that an exact paraphrase. And the one at the bottom, you can see is is not great, right? It's trans it's paraphrasing ocean as harbor, and also just so it isn't clear, the original sentence is the first one, and the paraphrase is the one in italics. And then uh, blue sky scenery, blue sky appearance, Mediterranean climate went to border situation, kind of noisy, um, but this is what we get out. So I also wanted to. Before I sort of use this to improve the, you know, the reference thing that we were talking about, I sort of wanted to get a sense of how good these are actually in terms of quality. So I, sh I took a random sample of 100 paraphrases like this along with the original source sentence that they were paraphrasing, those English uh, source sentence, and I showed them to people on Amazon mechanic, mechanic, Mechanical Turk and I asked them a simple question. How much meaning of the original sentence is retained by the, by the paraphrase? And I gave them three simple options. All of the meaning is retained, most of the meaning is retained, and none of the meaning is retained. So these are the results. <coughs> so like I said, uh, there's only a very small percentage where they're exactly paraphrases of each other, only 12%. Most of them are paraphrases in, in an approximate sense. Some of the meaning may be lost, but that's what it is. And there's, again, a small percentage that are actually garbage. So, it is clear that these paraphrases are not for human consumption, right? A human's going to look at it and say, uh, not so much. But 
are they good enough? That's, this was the problem I posed in my dissertation. Are they good enough to solve this problem that we have, that we don't have enough references, tra reference translations when we're doing parameter tuning? Here's the experimental setup. Um, so you have, um, this is what I do. So you have the source sentence, and you have the one human reference. That's a t box at the top. And you give that to the paraphraser, and you get out the three best paraphrases. Right? It's a decoder. It can give us not just the one best, but the three best. And then you say, I'm going to use the one human reference and the three artificial references as input to the parameter tuning algorithm and let it do its thing. Compute blue against all four references instead of just the one. And then I'll get out some tuned feature weights. And then I will use those tuned feature weights to translate a test set and see how well the, how well the output goes. So here's the results for Chinese translation. So that point um, on the left that I have right now is the baseline, which is the MT system tuned with just one human reference, right? So this is, where, this is where we would be if we didn't have anything else. So if you add a single paraphrase, you can see the jump in performance is statistically significant. It's huge. It goes from 37 point something blue to like close to 39 point something. So that's a two point blue increase. And then what happens is as you add more, or instead of just adding one best paraphrases and then three best paraphrases, although the gains are still there, they start to sort of go down. And then if you compare to a human, so I also asked, you know, I added one human, two human, three human, and four human references. And you can see that behavior is much better. It keeps, it, it increases, it plateaus, but at least it's going in the right direction. It doesn't have this weird behavior of going down. So what's going on there? So that's not important. So <clears throat> current paraphraser, basically what's going on is, if you think about it, the paraphraser is a, a translation system, right? Because essentially translating now, a translation system is motivated to change all of the source language into the target language, right? It's not going to say, yeah, I'm not going to touch this part of the Chinese, this Chinese phrase, because I don't really know what it is. I'm going to leave it as Chinese. That would be pretty bad. It's going to try to get its best guess for that Chinese phrase and move, you know, move it to the English side. So that's what this paraphraser is doing. It is trying to paraphrase everything that it can. It's not leaving anything unchanged, right? There's no motivation for it to do that because it's an MT system. So essentially, you're saying, I'm going to change everything and hope that some of the changes that are made are useful to me. Right? That's sort of a crapshoot, like, I'm going to change everything. So what about if we do it in a more targeted fashion where we only make the changes that are likely to be useful to us when doing the parameter tuning? And what does useful mean? Useful means that I am creating paraphrases that are likely to match my output. If I, so I'll actually show you an example. So if you look at the first one, that's the original reference you have right there. And the T, the second one, is the translation that your system outputs. So right now, you can see that it, the underlying phrase, was severely hit, doesn't match suffered a serious blow, right? Because even though they're talking about the same thing, blue is going to say that's not a match. And then if you get the, the PU is the original paraphraser that I showed before, that I call the untargeted paraphrase. So it changes that. Uh, it paraphrases O as this PU in which it is doing the right paraphrase. Was significantly impacted is the correct paraphrase, is a correct paraphrase for was severely hit. But it doesn't help me because it doesn't match what T says, right? So blue is still going to make it that it's, it's bad. Blue is still going to say it's bad. However, if I could make the paraphrase where was severely hit paraphrases to suffered a serious blow, which is what T says, then blue is going to say, yeah, that's the right thing. So we want PT, not PU. And I have another example, which isn't important. So the way to do this is you build a simple feature that says the number of words in the paraphrase hypothesis that are not in the translation output. So you first translate a single reference. You get out a translation. And then while you're doing the paraphrasing, you count the number of words that you're producing in the paraphrase that are not in the translation output. That's the measure of how useless the paraphrase is for this task. Right? Because if it produces words that are not in T, I can't use it. So, and then by negatively weighting this feature, by giving it a negative weight, I can coerce the paraphraser to only produce words that are in my translation output, which is what we want. Except, this, this could lead to a pretty nasty feedback loop, right? You, translations are already bad. So if I tell my paraphrase, oh yeah, this crap phrase, use this in your paraphrase, and then use it to tune the feature weights, and then you just keep going and going down in a spiral, and you just end up in like completely 
you know, bad, split, bad uh, part of the parameter space. So we need some sort of counterbalance feature. So the, the counterbalance feature is you basically take, tell the paraphrase, not leave it the same. So there's two counteracting features. One that says, change it to words that are in the translation output, and one that says, don't change anything at all. And if you find the right balance, that will pr prevent the um, feedback loop that I was talking about, but still give you, right? So the question is, how do you find this uh, balance between the two? And the fancy math that's in my dissertation that I do to, to figure this out, and it's not important here. You, sh you should just you know, accept that I did it. That's why I'm here. Um, so here's the, here's the next uh, experiment. So no isn't actually translating. So now you have this where I'm translating and giving that as a target to the paraphraser, which is now producing R2, R3, and R4 as targeted paraphrases, not as, you know, paraphrases that it was producing before. And I give those two and let it do its thing. One uh, caveat is note that before everything was done offline. I had a human reference. I could paraphrase it at my leisure and then give it to the tuning algorithm, right? But now I need to know the translation because I need to know how, what to target to. So this to uh, put that inside my loop, put the paraphrasing inside the parameter tuning algorithm. At each point, it's going to generate a bunch of translations and then generate a bunch of paraphrases and then find the best paraphrases, and then compute blue, move on to the next one, generate translations, compute paraphrases, and so on and so forth, before the compute paraphrase part was outside. So this takes about 10 times as long. But it pays off. So these are the old results. The dark brown line is the old paraphraser line. The, top li the light brown line is the uh, uh, human line. And here's the targeted paraphraser line. So you can see that it actually behaves just like a human, just Human, human references do, adding at each point, adding more and more references helps the translation performance. So it's, it's doing the right thing. And uh, I have similar results for a bunch of other languages that I did, and I got them validated on Mechanical Turk, but not important. So um, I just, it was, we have all this math and stuff and numbers, and yeah, OK, it's improving the performance. But I sort of, in my dissertation, I wanted a, an intuitive picture of what's actually happening in the various scenarios. This is the best. It's not flawless, but it's, it's the best analogy I could come up with. So imagine that you have a dartboard. And imagine matching a word sequence, which is what blue does, as hitting the bullseye on a dartboard. right? So using four human references, is like when you take the bullseye and you scale it up four times. There's lots more to match, right? So that's always good. You can hit the bullseye easier. Obviously, you can't do that. It's expensive. So using the untargeted paraphrases, which is the old way of paraphrasing that I showed before, which is not targeting to the translation output, it's like scaling the board. Like your board becomes bigger, but the bullseye becomes scrambled because some of them may not be useful. What, what at the position of the bullseye might be something else that's not useful to you. So it's sort of all over the board. So that's not useful. So with the targeted paraphrases, it's still scrambled a little bit. But then instead of shooting a dart like this, you're using a scope, because you're targeting exactly what you need. right? You're trying to match the exact engram that you need in your translation output. So that's sort of my analogy to describe uh, sort of what's going on. Um, so sort of a, a bit of summary, and then a little bit of tying back to you know, what I do now is you know, SMT obviously represents the current state of the art. And then you, this is what people don't generally talk about, is besides all this huge millions of training data, you need a specific kind of data for which you need multiple human translations to tune the parameters. And so that's expensive. So what, we, what I showed in my dissertation is you can actually use the components of the SMT system itself to manufacture this data for you and still get a almost um, close to human performance. Uh, human reference translation performance. So, so that, was, um, that was the thing that I showed. And so if you think about it, so right now this is what I'm doing, is if you think about this paraphraser, there's no reason that you cannot use it for other things. It's generating paraphrases. So this is the th sort of stuff that I'm using it for ETS, is we have this test that generates for which you, know, you have short answers. People, students have to write short fact-based answers. And there's a bunch of reference answers, right? But you can't always anticipate what students are going to write because they're very creative. And so you don't want to 
for giving you the right answer, but in words you didn't expect. So you can actually use this paraphraser to do exactly the same thing. You can take the reference answer you have, generate paraphrases for it, and now you have a much larger space, space against which you'll match the student answer. So that you know, makes things more, uh, more fair. And then we have this um, grant from IES where we're actually, one of the questions we have is, um, can students recognize paraphrases? Do they have that skill? And this is like ideally suited for this, right? Not only can you generate the right paraphrase, you can also generate the wrong ones. Because if you just look down the end best list that the decoder gives you, you look at after you know, number 100 or something, it's low because it's crap. So you can put them as distractors in addition to the right, right answer. And so you get all of those things for free. The other thing that I'm using for, which is not at the level of sentences, which is something that stuff that we're doing um, for opinion mining, we have some lexicon that we built. But then, obviously, the, the coverage of a manually built lexicon is going to have all possible words. So I actually ran my paraphraser on it and expanded the lexicon by like 10 times uh, so that it now has much more words in it. And it, they inherit the polarity of the seed source words. So, so I think this is the reason why ETS hired me, is they saw the potential of this, e this paraphrase thing to be applied to a whole lot of other things, not just the SMT stuff. And that's it. In time. <laughs> yes. So on the frivolous side, it sounds like a great thing for students trying to avoid plagiarism detection. On the serious I'm worried that any system based on the blue score for optimization mm -hmm. is going to drive towards the use of frequent words rather than less frequent words and thus make the translations mushier than they would otherwise be. Hmm. Um, yeah, I can sort of see that. Um, so the reason, so there's a reason why people use blue. There's lots of other metrics that have come along that sort of incorporate the notion of paraphrase the metric um, or do more you know, um, uh, principal things when it comes to figuring out whether two things are uh, related to each other. But the reason why blue still the most commonly used metric is nothing has sort of challenged its correlation with human judgments. So if you look at blue scores of some independent test set and you try to correlate you know, its, uh, with the human ratings of adequacy or fluency, no other metric that has come along that may be better in theory has actually challenged that. And the other thing is blue is really fast when it comes to parameter tuning. And since you won't have to do like at least 10 to 12 iterations of parameter tuning to get your SMT system to work, there's some pushback against any other new metric coming in and sort of making that a little bit more complicated or a little bit slower. But you're right. And people have sort of begun to recognize that blue is not perfect. And there, sh there are other things. And that's why on the evaluation side, in, in addition to blue, we now have, we need to, I think people are moving, excuse me, more and more towards human evaluations of translated output. So that would sort of, uh, you know, take care of some of the things you're talking about is the human translators would say, that's not really great. You should do something else. And on the other hand, the plagiarizing detectors can use the paraphrase and the two uh, I didn't say that, but we're actually doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yes? What about going beyond the sentence? Any chance of that? I'm not sure whether in the short term, because we're still struggling with translating sentences properly. So incorporating any sort of discourse or pragmatics into the machine translation pipeline is a tall order. It's, I'm not saying it's not necessary. It is necessary. But I think at some point where the community feels they've moved, I mean, I'm sure there are people who are sort of working on it now. But I think uh, where we're confident enough that the sentence level is at a place where we can sort of start exploring more supra-sentential relationships, um, given structure, or uh, other discourse relationships. I think that's definitely a way to go. So it's going to happen. I don't know when. <laughs> yeah. I'm not clear on why it is not possible to analyze your concepts to start using statistical <coughs> models. Mm -hmm. So I think right now the translation model relies on the algorithm that discovers alignments relies on sentence boundaries. So it can only it can only it doesn't take into 
on any context. And the language So there's some sort of tools, um, sort of uh, constraints, computational constraints on tools that prevent you from language you know, where the contexts are longer than you know, four words on each side or something within a sentence. Not, so there's, there's sort of more computational constraints. But also, I think, I think a better model would be sort of something that explicitly models relationship between sentences as opposed to just you know, computing with more context. So I think, I think that would be, so that's the sort of leap. What you're talking about is sort of what people are exploring now, sort of. But I think what I, what I envision is more where you're sort of, your features are more related to discourse features and you know, sort of things like that. And you're not essentially just. Um, I haven't really thought about it that much. But yeah, something sort of more, more like that, more abstract where, yeah, I don't think we were there yet. Because that by itself doesn't work very well, is figuring out what the theme of a topic is. I mean, as Jordan showed you, topic models are far from perfect. So, so uh, did, you, did you notice, like, if you look at the paraphrase, look different languages as the five pivot? Like, if you pivot from Chinese, yes. are you going to end up having different type of paraphrases? Uh, from Spanish, they might be different. So here's, here's sentential paraphrases that I get with French instead of Chinese. And in general, French things that come out of French are much better because the things that come out of Chinese, because the alignment algorithm is the culprit. The alignment algorithm doesn't really figure out how to map Chinese words to English words properly because they're so different in, you know, in terms of a lot of linguistic characteristics. Whereas French and English are pretty, you know, languages that are pretty close. So it, the, al the alignment algorithm does a pretty good job of finding, uh, discovering the alignments between words and then from then on, once the alignments are good, everything else is good, right? Phrases are good, features are good, um, pivoting is good, so, yeah. But I think it will be interesting to look at much closer at what type of maybe syntactic construction or like or anything like that. that kind of yeah, sort of more, sort of a typology of the things that are better in one versus the other. Uh, I agree, it would be, right. Yeah, that would be an interesting thing to try. I think for the stuff that I'm doing at um, ETS, I'm trying to focus more on precision. Because this is a, right now, for this work, I focus on coverage. Because I wanted to be able to paraphrase anything. So I, I, the, the thing that I wanted was, I wanted to use as large a uh, uh, data set of you know, Chinese English as possible. Whereas in, at ETS, because these things are going to be used for assessments or whatever, I have to be more careful about pay more attention to precision than recall. So there, I am focusing more on European languages as opposed to like languages like Chinese or Arabic or something. So, uh, but you're right. It would be nice to do sort of a, a more detailed analysis. Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Oh, thank you.